Good morning. I'm Stephen Bader, Executive Director of the East Bay Economic Development Alliance, or East Bay EDA. We're excited that many of you are joining us today for our second webinar of 2023, this one being about the future of public transit. As a regional economic development organization, East Bay EDA strives to bring timely and relevant information to our members, partners, and other stakeholders, including the public, so that we can all be better informed about key issues affecting the economic vitality and quality of life in our region. Having quality public transportation networks and systems are a foundational component of economic development, <clears throat> particularly in large metropolitan areas such as ours. East Bay ADA called out the importance of investing in regional and local multimodal transportation infrastructure to support job growth and accessibility in our East Bay Forward Regional Economic Blueprint that we published about 18 months ago. And unfortunately, the pandemic has dealt a serious blow to the financial sustainability and viability of our region's public transportation systems with ridership dropping precipitously during the initial issuance of shelter in place orders when the impacts of COVID-19 were beginning to manifest. And now more than three years later, ridership and usage are still far less than it was before the pandemic upended our lives and world, impacts that we not only see in our bigger cities, but also our smaller ones as well. So today we're really fortunate because we have a fantastic panel of transportation experts with us here to surface some of the critical issues facing our public transportation systems and offer ways in which we can all help to support their continued operation. So without further ado, I will turn this over to Tess Yell, Executive Director of the Alameda Ca County Transportation Commission and Chair of East Bay ADA's Land Use and Infrastructure Committee to get us going. Tess, take it away. Thank you, Stephen, and welcome to all of the participants to this very, very important topic that we have the opportunity to talk about today. The future of public transit, supporting and sustaining our public transit system. And I want to take a moment to thank East Bay EDA for creating this platform for us to have this opportunity to have this discussion on this critical topic. Uh, in the Bay Area, we have a long history of transit. Um, some of our transit operators that are here today harken back to early formation in the 1950s, a period when massive uh, highway expansion was happening. Here in the Bay Area, civic leaders and business leaders saw the importance of quality transit and started investing in it by the creation of some of our largest transit systems. We also uh, saw the formation of County Connection in 1980, serving Central Contra Costa County, um, supporting the growth and, and connectivity in Contra Costa County. We've developed our communities, our businesses around transit infrastructure, our stations. We've connected our transit systems together to really help to create a vibrant uh, Bay Area that's sustainable, equitable, and our transit systems have been reliable services that have supported and continue to support the Bay Area economy and our workforce. Um, as we emerge from the pandemic, as Stephen noted, transit is facing a fiscal cliff. Um, a societal shift has changed on when and how people use transit, many people use transit. Um, we know that in downtown San Francisco and the city of Oakland, that those two cities have some of the lowest rate of office in-person occupancy in North America. And that has affected our transit systems. That has affected fare box recovery and ridership. But at the same time, transit has been a workforce for our essential uh, workers and for community members that don't have other options. And we know that transit riders are disproportionately low income and people of, um, and people of color. Um, and so transit continues to be an essential service and an essential service we all need. What we've seen today is that transit ridership across the Bay Area remains at about 53% on average of pre-pandemic levels. But over 21 million passengers are taking transit on a monthly basis, and that is rising year over year. Fortunately, through the pandemic, we did have federal funding that supported transit in some of the darkest days. Um, but we know that that federal funding dries up at the end of fiscal year 24-25. We do need commitments to help support 
this gap we're facing in funding for transit as transit agencies are responding to the changing riderships, the changing society that we have today, so that they can retool their services to match the needs of our ridership. Um, today, what we're looking to explore are the ramifications of the COVID pandemic and the changed work travel patterns and how that has affected our transit providers. What are the implications of the transit fiscal cliff we're facing? How are our operators responding and adjusting to the issue? And what can you do as a participant of this webinar and within your own community to help to support transit? I'm delighted to be here today with uh, three of my favorite people in the transportation industry, um, longtime colleagues, um, who will share with you specifically information on what's happening on two bus transit operators and one rail operator here in the Bay Area. I'd like to start off by um, introducing each of them very briefly, and then um, we'll have the first speaker um, present, and then I'll reintroduce speakers subsequently. So Bill Churchill, um, Bill, if you don't mind waving your hand there, Bill Churchill is the general manager of the Contra Costa County uh, Connection. He's going to be kicking us off, followed by Beverly Green, who's the executive director of external affairs, uh, marketing and communications at AC Transit. And then Rod Lee will sum up our presentations. He's the assistant general manager of external affairs at BART. Um, each of our panel members will have about seven to 10 minutes in their presentation, and then we aim to stop the presentations around uh, 1145 and have the opportunity for Q&A. So with that, Bill, I'm going to turn it over to you as a general manager of the Contra Costa County Connection to start us off. Well, thank you, Tess. And, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and share some of my perspectives. I think my goal today is to to is really to provide a more macro perspective of where we are today and where I think things are moving as we look to the future. And then I'll, I'll turn it back over to you to go to Beverly and Rod to maybe give insights on specific agencies at a, at a, at a you know, more specific level. And, you know, not to be redundant, but, you know, as we all know, the, the pandemic has had a profound impact on public transit as we know it in the Bay Area. And our passengers have really not returned in the same way or at the same rate as in other parts of our nation and indeed the world. It's important to understand, actually, the degree to which San Francisco impacts the Bay Area as a whole and how the dense high-tech job market has contributed to a profound loss in transit riders and passengers. As Tess stated, San Francisco has the lowest rate of return to the physical workplace of any major metropolitan city in the world, resulting in 150,000 less individuals in the downtown area as compared to pre-pandemic numbers. So this has resulted in empty, unused commercial space. And this is an amazing thing to me. It's equal to 20 Salesforce towers in the downtown area. It, it's nearly impossible to grasp and imagine the enormity of that. So what does this mean? BART, for example, we'll just take one, as a regional rail system is not bringing those individuals into the city from the outer reaches of Antioch or Livermore or Richmond. And the bus systems that connect to BART are not carrying those commuters that used to travel to San Francisco. So the drop in ridership actually radiates outward from San Francisco, impacting transit operators as far away as 50 miles away in multiple directions. And this has resulted in a profound loss of revenue for a number of transit agencies in the Bay Area, primarily those that rely on the passenger fare as their primary source of revenue, such as BART and Caltrain. SFMTA or Muni, has been uniquely hit on three primary revenue sources, the loss of fares, loss of parking and citation revenue, and the loss of general funds as sales taxes down. And Muni is one of the few operators in our nation that actually receives general funds from their local city. So collectively, over the next five years, this represents a shortfall of about $2.5 billion in the Bay Area and over $6 billion statewide and if not remedied, will result in what we call a transit death spiral. 
As we attempt to cut service, to reduce our expenses, we find it ultimately results in less riders and a further loss of revenue, and around and around we go. So what have we been doing about it? I think it's important to provide a perspective of what the operators as a whole across the Bay Area have attempted to do. So first and foremost, the transit operators have worked collaboratively with MTC on an array of efforts to improve the transit network as a whole. Transit played a key role and participated in the MTC established Blue Ribbon Transit Recovery Task Force and helped develop the Transformation Action Plan that identified 27 actions to improve public transit in the Bay Area. Transit was also part and parcel to developing a system and a structure for a regional network management of the Bay Area transit system. Secondly, and probably less well known, and just as important, all the general managers in the entire Bay Area have been meeting every single week since the onset of the pandemic to ensure the sharing of best practices on safety, COVID mitigation, system and schedule coordination, to collaborate together in marketing efforts, and to share resources with each other to implement a host of transportation improvements that are quite frankly too many to enumerate. But I think it would be good if I provide some examples just to give you a sense of what we have accomplished. Um, I think one of the, the biggest things we did is we have aligned our scheduled service changes so that they occur at the same time. This ensures that all the transit agencies in the Bay Area are in sync with each other and minimizes disruptions to our customers. We've worked on transfer hub coordination throughout the Bay to improve the customer experience as they move from one system to another. I think a really great example of this is the BART Caltrain transfer at the Millbrae station. The trains are now coordinated such that when you transfer from one system to another, you're merely walking across the platform. Over the last three years, Muni has created a multitude and many more miles of red bus and HOV lanes, and then they've shared those lanes with Golden Gate Transit so that they have the same advantages traveling through the city as Muni. We've renumbered bus routes where confusion exists between different operators in close proximity. And here is a great one. BART shares their raw train schedule data with bus operators, like County Connection. We take that data, we insert it into our own scheduling programs in order to build bus schedules that closely coordinate with train schedules. In addition to our own efforts that we have made, we continue to make progress on a host of projects in conjunction with MTC. We've made lots of progress on integrating our fares. We've implemented the Bay Pass pilot project, providing unlimited rides on buses, trains, and ferries throughout the Bay Area for students from a number of select universities and colleges. And as this pilot demonstrates the success, we look forward to its expansion. We continue to work on improvements on our mapping and wayfinding. We're in the process of developing a cohesive zero emission bus conversion plan that will allow for joint procurements and for the sharing of charging infrastructure at major transit hubs, BART stations, and the education of our workforce. Finally, and probably most relevant today, the transit operators have been working both with MTC and the California Transit Association to educate our state legislators on the need for state operating assistance for those agencies facing an immediate fiscal cliff. What's important to understand here is that we're not just advocating for transit agencies in the Bay Area, but for all transit agencies facing a fiscal cliff across the entire state. We have been tirelessly meeting with our state legislators on a regular basis, testifying at budget and transportation hearings, and we have built what we believe is a balanced and responsible financial ask of the legislature that minimizes the hit to the state general fund as we recognize the state is also facing a massive shortfall. And our ask is temporary. We're requesting support over the next five years to provide time to grow our ridership, 
seek new and seek new local measures to help fund transit in a more stable way. So what does this mean for the future of transit, which I think ultimately is why we're here? Well, for starters, and I think the silver lining that resulted from the pandemic is that the coordination among the public transit operators within the Bay Area, regardless of mode, bus, train, or ferry, is unprecedented. It's resulted in a cohesive, connected fabric of transportation blanketing the entire region. And it's important to recognize the work transit operators are engaged in is not done, and we now know never will be. Rather, I think we've created together a new approach to ensuring a world-class transportation system that is on a course or a pathway of continued improvement and enhancement. We all know that the state of California cannot meet their greenhouse gas emission reduction goals without public transit. We're key to that process, and I believe the legislature recognizes it. So I guess I take the positive view. I think the legislature and the governor will produce a budget that will help those transit agencies in dire need to avoid the fiscal cliff. And that, combined with the system-wide collaborative approach in managing our transit systems, will see ridership growth as individuals will begin to return to work and find a much more cohesive transit network when they do. So I have a positive outlook, and I think that it's going to improve and it's going to get better as we move forward. I don't see it any other way. And with that, Tess, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Bill, thank you so much for that overview. I think it's important that people really have the opportunity to understand the depth of work, collaboration, actual physical changes that have occurred amongst all the transit operators to implement best practices, tighter coordination, public facing um, service uh, uh, tools, fare integration, and also for people to understand the gravity of the 2.5 billion over the next five years that we here in the Bay Area face and the 6 billion over the next five years for the state of California. So one call to action already that we've heard today is help support transit operators by talking to the state legislatures, state legislators as they are finalizing the budget. Um, with that, I'd like to now turn over to Beverly Green. Beverly is the Executive Director of External Affairs, Marketing and Communications at AC Transit. And Beverly, we'd love to hear all of the work that AC Transit is doing at, at retooling your services to respond to this and coming out even stronger. Thank you, Tess. Let me first of all, refamiliarize everyone with AC Transit. We are the largest bus only public transit system in California and the third largest bus only public transit agency, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, in the United States. We serve one and a half million people across 13 cities and eight unincorporated areas in Western Alameda and Contra Costa counties. Our riders include students, seniors, and people with disabilities. 65% of our riders are low income and 75% are people of color. Nearly half of our riders, 43%, do not have access to a working vehicle. We are the backbone of transportation in the East Bay, connecting, connecting to 16 other public and public, the public and private bus systems. 25 BART stations, six Amtrak stations, and five ferry terminals. We are the largest, we are the East Bay's largest mobility provider. We provide service, supplemental service to the East Bay schools, making 30,000 trips from home to school and back every school day. When the pandemic hit, we had to make lots of changes. Next slide. And what that resulted in is that we needed to decide how we were actually going to um, put service back in when we had the dramatic loss. And so what we did was we ranked bus lines on three factors. What was their pre-COVID weekday productivity? Uh, we wanted to make sure that we provided service for people for low for people with low incomes within a quarter mile of our service. 
and then also to people of color within one quarter of a mile. Um, we, you know, in terms of service across Bay Bridges, that was, that's been sort of delayed until the demand increases. Um, next slide. But even in spite of our challenges with um, the operating deficit, which is projected to be about 144 million over the next five years, um, with significant deficit in beginning in FY25, we've been doing what we can to improve reliability and to have greater connectivity. Um, we paused reactivating low ridership rot lines. Um, we've reduced operator overtime. We've been adjusting schedules and frequencies so that we can increase our reliability. And we understand that that's been, we know that's been an issue. Um, for the month of, month of March, we had 97% of scheduled trips that were completed during that month. And as Bill already spoke about, we have been working with the other transit regions, transit operators in the region for higher connectivity and higher um, integration. We have projects in place to improve transit. We have dedicated program trans program staff that are going to be focusing on that. And again, we have deeper regional coordination. Next slide. So some of the things that we've been working on to help to get our um, service in the right place have to do with recruiting operators. Um, that's one of the largest challenges that we have uh, to be able to deliver our service. And so some of the things that we've been doing are a $2,000 operator hiring bonus. We have a $500 referral bonus for employees. We've been hosting um, many, many in-person recruiting events. And actually on Saturday, there is a large uh, spring into your new career uh, in-person hiring event where there will be conditional offers that were going to be placed. Um, we have a recruiting bus and also there will be conditional on-site offers. We have a recruitment, a very robust recruitment effort uh, in terms of advertising all across traditional and new media to try to increase our bus operators so that we can continue to increase our reliability. Next slide. Some of the other uh, efforts that we've been undertaking to improve our reliability and in while we are in recovery, um, we participated with other operators in a riding together campaign. Um, we had an all aboard Bay Area campaign to encourage riders to come back. We suspended scheduled fare increases, which that obviously affects our revenue. Uh, we offered fare free fraud fare free rides. We joined the Clipper Start pilot program, which offers a 20% discount on fares. Um, we obviously reactivated service to schools. We launched a new rider app with real-time information and very significantly has contactless payment. We released a new system map so that people would really understand how to get to where they need to go. We piloted all door boarding. Um, and we conducted several virtual community town halls to update riders, and we launched the AC Transit Realign campaign. Next slide, the Realign project. So this is very exciting for AC Transit. Uh, it is a multidisciplinary effort to evaluate the entire system, to analyze how travel patterns have changed in the East Bay, and engage with the community to determine the future of our route network. There are five phases uh, as a part of this. And phase one, which is moving through currently right now through June, is we're focusing on what riders want and need. Um, we are driving folks to fill out a survey and do a lot of focused market and service analysis. In phase two, which is, takes place in July and August, we'll show people draft guiding principles and the homework we did on rider needs to development. We'll also ask how well the draft principles reflect how people use transit or want to use it. And based on what we hear, we'll refine the principles and make them the basis for the plan options we develop. In phase three, which takes place in the fall period, um, our planners will huddle with their consultant team to develop multiple draft plan scenarios that reflect these guiding principles established in phase two. 
And then in November and December, we'll show people these draft plan scenarios and see what they think. What options do they like? What options do they not like? Are there pieces of these plan options that we should roll into a preferred option? And from that work, our planners will huddle with consultants again to develop one final service plan scenario. In, plan, in phase four, we'll draft the final service plan scenario through our form, formal public hearing process. Um, and we'll hold public hearings to close the comment period and the board will make a final decision on that new network in mid-April. Um, phase five, which is April through September, will develop service stand standards, which will be a future guiding document that carries the spirit of the plan forward into our future planning and will also inform and educate riders on the August changes with a robust public communications and outreach point. So, this is what we're doing in the face of a huge, um, for us, financial challenge. Again, as we face about $144 million in deficit over the next five years, uh, beginning in FY25, this major comprehensive operations analysis to see what we can do to help um, provide the service that our riders need and deserve given the resources we have as we advocate quite heavily as Bill referenced to the state to get bridge funding as we um, consider a regional uh, revenue measure. So that concludes my comments. I will hand it over to my colleague, Rod Lee. Well, Beverly, thank you very much for sharing what the third largest bus only operator in the United States um, AC Transit is doing to not only address the transit fiscal cliff, um, but creating a very open and integrated opportunity for the public to weigh in on the restructuring of uh, some of AC Transit services. So thank you for that. And I'd like to turn to Rod Lee, Assistant General Manager, External Affairs, BART, um, for you to share with us Rod, what is happening at BART and some opportunities for people to weigh in on the on the transit fiscal cliff. Thanks, Tess. And Tess, thank you for your leadership uh, in the region through ACTC. We really appreciate all you're doing to assist all of our agencies in being able to move forward into the future. And also thank you, uh, Stephen, to you and to East Bay EDA for convening this forum for us to have this discussion. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. I have several slides here, but in the essence of time so that we can get to discussion as well as some of the information that's been covered. Um, and most importantly, because uh, the area I wanna spend the most amount of time on is improving the rider experience so that we can regain our ridership in our BART system. So I'm going to spend the most amount of time on that section. Uh, I'm, I'm aware that this slide deck will be sent out uh, to all the participants. So if there's any follow-up questions or more discussion that needs to be had on any areas of this presentation, feel free to contact me directly. So if we can go to the first slide. If we can change to the first slide on monthly ridership. So this slide here just gives you a quick depiction in regards to our ridership, uh, where it dropped to in March of 2020. You can see on this graph here, it dropped down to 6% in April of 2020. And then now currently it's at 42%. Something that Tess and Bill mentioned earlier, which is depicted on the next slide, shows the return to office trends. It's a, uh, a graph that's been put together by the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce that actually shows that the downtown San Francisco occupancy rate correlates directly with our ridership at about 42%. Do we have the next slide, possibly? Yes, are we having some technical problems? Should I just go through without the slides? Perlene or Stephen, are you available to advance the slides? I think. Sorry, there is a lag, but let me try to reopen it. Sorry about okay. that. Okay, so let's do this. As I mentioned, the most important part of my presentation to you all, which I think is probably most salient to the participants and uh, their member organizations, 
is about improving the rider experience. We can just skip to slide seven if, if the slide deck is working right now. Rod, like we're good. All right. Let, why let's, don't you go ahead and keep going, um, and we'll hopefully have the slides uh, catch right. up at some point. Yeah. Why, why don't we do this? We can just take the slides down for right now, and let me just talk to improving the rider experience. So we can keep our audience following along with this. So our mission at BART is to provide safe, reliable, and clean transit service. And we take that mission statement very seriously every day. And we know that there are some doubts about safety in BART. It's critical that we own those concerns. Many of our former riders say they don't think BART is safe, and that's why they are not returning post-pandemic. While we disagree with that conclusion, we acknowledge that, that that's how many people feel about our system, and we must show them the results on safety. So I'm going to talk about a few of our initiatives. So we have a lot of work ahead of us by, by taking steps now that, to keep us on track. There's nothing more important to us than doing all we can to ensure safety. Many of the safety challenges we face are larger than BART, it must be addressed on a regional level. That's why our police chief is reaching out to our partner enforcement, law enforcement agencies to enhance collaboration. We're more effective for the Bay Area when we work together and maximize resources. We're excited to share with you our latest safety initiatives. Our focus is on using all available resources to boost our visible presence in the BART system. This effort includes both sworn officers as well as non-sworn crisis intervention specialists, transit ambassadors, community service officers, and fare inspectors. BART launched a big redeployment plan in March of this year that has dramatically increased the number of officers on our trains. We now have an additional eight to 18 officers patrolling trains per shift. That has more than doubled the presence of sworn officers on our trains. The visible safety presence is making a difference. From the first day of the new deployment plan through April 16th, almost a full month, the BART Police Department recorded a 38% decrease in calls for service and a 40% increase in arrests. Like every other police department in the country, the BART Police Department faces challenges when it comes to hiring officers. There are few quality candidates and the market is extremely competitive. But despite those conditions, we are doing more than ever to hire officers and make certain that we get our police department fully staffed. We are now recruiting to fill 29 sworn officer vacancies. Full funding for each of those openings has been approved by the BART Board of Directors, and we are working hard to add more officers to our team. We have been aggressively doing public outreach, and we're offering a $15,000 hiring bonus, and our general manager and our BART Board are in talks right now about boosting the hiring incentives to lure more qualified candidates to our police department. The opioid crisis and homelessness epidemic are challenges bigger than BART. Transit agencies weren't meant to deal with these societal issues, but many of the incidents that riders are most concerned about often involve someone in crisis. Doing nothing isn't an option for BART, nor for the BART Police Department. Crisis intervention specialists are doing great work making contacts with people in the BART system who need help. In just four weeks, from mid-March to mid-April, our CISs made nearly 2,000 contacts with people in need of services. We're encouraged by our recent progress since we launched the new redeployment plan, but we also know we have a lot of work ahead of us. We welcome that challenge. We're going to build upon the steps we've taken in recent months to get as many officers as possible onto our trains recruit new officers to build up our department, 
and continue to count on unarmed members of our BART Police Department to maximize our presence. We know the stakes couldn't be higher for both BART and the Bay Area. If we can boost our ridership, then we can be the engine that helps drive the revitalization of our downtown core areas. The key step in getting riders back is to offer them a safe experience that they can believe in. And we are committed to that. I just wanna take a, a few more minutes just to talk about fare gates and cleaning and our service. So first about fare gates. We're excited we're moving forward with the new fare gate. And this will be new fare gates system-wide. The first of the new fare gates will be installed in West Oakland later this year. Not only will they be entry points that have a revitalized appearance, but these new gates will be resistant to abuse and to fare evasion. This will be a big win for rider safety. Furthermore, the gates will improve access for people who are using wheelchairs or people who are pushing strollers going into our system. The gates will be designed to optimize reliability and reduce maintenance needs. Our goal is to have the new gates installed system-wide by 2026. Next slide, please. Our riders have also told us they wanna see cleaner trains and cleaner stations. This is another part of the rider experience where we are taking action through hiring and making the most of our limited resources. We're now thoroughly cleaning the interiors of all of our Fleet of the Future cars twice as often. Eight members, or excuse me, eight teams rather, of car cleaners scrub cars when they're in overnight storage. This deep cleaning is in addition to the quick clean crews that sweep through trains at the end of the line during operating hours. We also are adding fund, we're also adding four more deep cleaning teams who will focus on scrubbing heavily used stations. Those four cleaning teams represent a 66% increase in the number of crews scrubbing stations. This deep cleaning includes pressure washing, as you can see pictured here, also cleaning throughout the system in all of our, all of our stations. Next slide, please. So finally, regarding improved service and, and reliability. Beginning in September of this year, no BART rider will wait more than 20 minutes for a scheduled train, no matter what time of the day of the week. We are increasing service on nights and weekends to prioritize ridership growth potential from trips not related to a work commute. We are also boosting service on the yellow line. This is the busiest line in our system. It extends from Contra Costa County under the bay into San Francisco, and then onto San Francisco International Airport. Trains on the yellow line will now arrive every 10 minutes before 9 p.m. instead of every 15 minutes. The new service plan will enhance our reliability and on-time performance during the peak commute because there will be less train traffic and congestion through the core of the system. Better spacing will allow us to recover from delays much faster. So that concludes uh, my presentation. I'm totally open to questions, Tess, at this point, or I'll pass it back over to you. Rod, thank you very much. Thank you for touching on and hitting head on, you know, the what, what some people have talked about in terms of safety and riding public transit. I think it's really important for people to know and understand all the efforts that are that BART is doing and transit operators are doing to make sure that it's clean, safe, and reliable our transit services. So really appreciate that. Um, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to go ahead and open it up to questions from our audience. And um, I think we're opening up the Q&A here. And I have, there are a couple of questions. So what I'd like to mention to the participants today is we do have a, a Q&A um, option for you to submit questions. And um, we'll go ahead and, and aim to go through those questions. If there are a lot that come through, I will aim to group them. And we have a couple here right now. 
Um, the first question is, when will it be easier to get to Alameda from Oakland without a car? <laughs> That's the first question. And then why are only the uh, fleet of the future BART cars getting extra cleaning services? So Beverly, uh, do you want to take the first one about getting to Alameda from Oakland? I do. And actually, uh, it is fortuitous that this question is asked. We were just on an Alameda AC Transit Interliaison Committee meeting this morning before our seminar where we talked about reliability. And that is what we're focused on. So um, we are really trying to make sure that we fill 100% of our scheduled runs and that we were at that whatever time we say that we are going to provide a bus, that we do provide the bus. So um, that that is what we're going to be focusing on. So we are going to continue to run, to run the bus service that we have, but we expect that our reliability will go up as we reallocate our resources uh, and tweak what we need to do so that when the bus is scheduled to get to your location in Alameda or Oakland going to the other location, it is there. Great. Thank you, Beverly. Um, and Rod, can you talk a little bit about the, um, the question about extra cleaning um, for the fleet of the future BART cars as compared to other cars? Certainly, Tess. Thank you for the question. So as everyone probably is uh, are well aware, we are replacing our entire fleet of train cars with the fleet of the future train cars. And right now we're, we're proud to say that over 50% of our current fleet are fleet of, the fleet, fleet of the future train cars. And our focus is on all of our train cars to clean those. But as we have more and more of our fleet of the future train cars in the system, we wanna make certain that folks when they get on those new train cars have a really good experience. Um, so our focus is on all of the train cars, but we're doubling down on our fleet of the future uh, as we have a more preponderance of those in our system. Okay, thank you, Rod. I don't see any other questions that have come in through the Q&A. So again, I invite the audience uh, participants to submit questions if you have them. What I'd like to ask the panelists, um, given that there has been so much work uh, to advocate. Well, first, let me back up. I just want to appreciate and thank all of the transit operators for how much you are doing to come together. The pan <clears throat> pandemic sort of threw us all <laughs> apart, and we've come together, I think, more strongly than ever to retool the systems, to really come together to make it the public facing uh, services that they are making the rider uh, experience better, crafting plans, crafting opportunities for people to weigh in. Can you share a little bit about what your perspectives are around the um, advocacy with the state legislators and what you're hearing from the state? And is there anything else that you think that the participants here um, might be important for them to, to know about um, as we're trying to seek support from the state legislators. So I'll jump in first and then um, ask my colleagues to also join since we all three of us were at the California State Legislative Conference. So in addition to my job at AC Transit, I'm also the state, the chair of the California Transit Association State Legislative Committee. And we have had two full days of advocating on behalf of Bay Area Transit so that we can get the resources to provide the public transit that our riders deserve and need. This includes our shared constituents. There are people who ride BART that also ride AC Transit, that also ride County Connection. Um, these are our parents. These are our children that go to school. Um, these are our seniors, our, our people with disabilities, and people that need transit to get to work. Like This is what provides the economic um, engine for the entire Bay Area and beyond. It's people must be able to get to their jobs and their destination. So, um, and I will let uh, Rod talk about speaking on the um, select committee meeting that was convened by State Senator Weiner. Um, Bill Churchill has been very, very active. Um, we've met with the um, 
State Senate Pro Tem's office. We've met with our entire delegations. We have been making the case for public transit. And it is important that our constituents and our attendees reach out to the legislators. As you know, the state has its own deficit, uh, which is the number just keeps growing. Uh, and this really threatens um, public transit. So we really need people to to let their legislators know how important public transit is. Um, we, we, we must do that. Um, our legislators are dealing with competing priorities right now. We just as Rod Lee spoke about, you know, there are issues with um, people who are unhoused. There are issues with people who um, have uh, challenges with, you know, drug issues. Um, and, and the legislature is balancing many competing priorities. So I would say that's uh, important. The legislature members have come back to us and they are not promising anything right now. They are saying, what are you doing on your own to make sure that you uh, get the, have the funds? You know, what, what is your skin in the game? Uh, we've been talking about performance measures. Um, so there's, there's nothing that's guaranteed. And I'll uh, defer over here to Rod and to Bill to also talk about the most recent legislative advocacy efforts that we're undertaking. Rod, you want to weigh in first, and then we'll go to you, Bill. Certainly. I just want to add one thing. Beverly covered that extraordinarily well in regards to all the efforts that we're doing and a call to action. I just want to note that um, uh, you all may be tracking this, but in, in the May revise, that there is not any money that's been identified for transit operations funding. But not only that, still in the May revise, there's $2 billion in cuts and transit funding for capital programs. So not only is there not money for transit operations, but there's cuts to capital projects, which could affect state of good repair for a lot of agencies. So it's just imperative that we all collectively, and Bill mentioned this, the GMs, he and the fe his fellow GMs are doing an extraordinary job, unprecedented in regards to coordination and collaboration. We need help. They need help. We we all have to be in this together in order to make certain that we have transit agencies that survive to be able to provide the opportunity for people to get to and from um, wherever they need to go, uh, but especially to revitalize our economy here within the Bay Area. So, um, Beverly, I appreciate your commentary. I just want folks to know that overall, transit is in a very pre um, precarious situation right now from an operation standpoint, as well as from a capital standpoint. Thank you, Rod. How about you, Bill? Would you like to weigh in? Well, you know, both Beverly and Rod, you, you really have hit the nail on the head, and I really appreciate your, your comments. Um, I think it's important, though, for people to speak up and reach out to their own electeds and let them know directly how important transit is for them. You know, we're a voice, and we're on... Uh, our trips to the hearings and to the legislators, and we we have those meetings. But it's important to understand that you know they see us as advocating for ourselves. But it's more important for the individuals that use our systems to to reach out to their legislators and let them know how important these systems are to them. Transit is sort of the unsung hero of the economic engine of the Bay Area, and I think people don't recognize how important that can be to all of our daily lives. And um, without it, that economic engine is not going to come back and it's not going to grow. And so it needs to be supported and it needs to be supported beyond just general managers and, and transit professionals throughout the system it needs to be supported by our communities and our residents. Yeah. Um, the other thing that is important to recognize, we cannot meet our state climate goals without public transit. The only way to get there is to reduce the amount of cars on our highways, reduce congestion. And the number one way of doing that is public transit. So we need to somehow change our cultural mindset 
and get more than just some of the lower socioeconomic layers. We need all of us riding transit if we're going to make some headway on, on, on those issues. So I think it's really a, a for 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 two significant foundational reasons we need to support our local transit. Yeah. Thank you all for so clearly and succinctly talking about what you have done uh, in working with their, the legislative legislators and how much more work needs to be done. In fact, um, one of the attendees asked if there's a template letter um, to the legislators that spells out the talking points that could be offered to the participants. And Stephen, I, I put that out to you at East Bay EDA. Is that something that East Bay EDA could do as a follow-up with this and working with our partners here uh, on transit? Um, that's something that could potentially be a follow-up, and, and Steve and I look to you to answer that. Um, but in the meantime, we do have uh, several other questions that have come in, and I do want to uh, touch on a couple of these. I know we're getting a little bit tighter on time, but we did talk about San Francisco and Oakland and how office workers have not returned. We are the lowest in the nation uh, in terms of large metropolitan areas for office worker return to, to work. And this question is, what feedback are you getting from employers on plans to, for return to office? And how do you expect this to change over the next 12 months? Do any of you have uh, particular feedback on that? I know that the um, uh, the Bay Area Council does a monthly survey. I don't have those numbers right off the top of my head. But what I would offer, if we don't have the answer to that, Again, I think if we could uh, follow up with the participants and send out a link to that information about how those surveys are, are coming in. So I'll just add something quickly. Um, so as you said, the Bay Area Council um, surveys employers, they've been surveying employers for a couple of years to find out about what the patterns are. And clearly commute patterns have affected transit, especially in the Bay Area. Um, we, you know, in terms of people coming to work, these are not the patterns that they were before, where a large number of people work between 8.30 and 5.30. So you have the high commute, the AM commute period and the high PM commute period. And part of what the Bay Area Council has found, and we can forward that information, is that people are roughly coming in about three days a week. So this compares to five days a week. And even if you just did, you know, do simple math, that means 40% of the fair revenues are not coming in. That's just the simple part. Um, part of what the Bay Area Council poll has found is that most people are coming in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So we are looking at, you know, how, how do we tweak our service or how do we take that into account given what the new commute patterns are? And I'll, I'll stop there and uh, leave the rest of it to my colleagues, Bill and, and uh, Rod. What, you know, I, I don't think the story is uniform throughout the Bay Area. And I think as you look at different geographical components of the Bay Area, it, it's different. So I can address maybe my area, which is um, Central Contra Costa. And I have spent quite a bit of time talking to the major employers. One of the largest would be uh, Bishop Ranch, which in, in the past, pre-pandemic, was a significant driver of our ridership and a significant driver of our commute ridership. They don't see a return um, at any significant rate over the next few years. And in fact, they are beginning to divest themselves of quite a bit of their property, and they're beginning to uh, diversify into residential housing because they're not going to see, in their view, um, a real massive return to the workplace. So I think what that's going to happen for what's going to happen for County Connection is we'll be responding in a different way because you you respond to a commute pattern in specific ways. And Beverly really um, said it succinctly when she said a commute pattern has two large peaks. When you're dealing with a residential pattern, it's consistent all throughout the day and it has um I guess, wider endpoints. It starts earlier in the morning and ends later in the evening. So I think we're going to continue to see changes in patterns. 
And we're going to have to continue to figure out how to work together in responding to those changes. Yeah, thank you. Brad. Yeah, Tess, I just wanted to add that um, from Bart's perspective, we're, we're really data driven. And we're looking very closely um, at the data in regards to ridership. And we're looking at the poll results from employers. And the, the first chart there, a graph that I showed, showed our ridership from uh, 2020 to the present. And currently, I mentioned we're at about 42%. But we're been, we've been stable right around 40% over the last several months. And that bodes with what Beverly and, and Bill were saying in regards to the return to work or working in the office days currently. We're seeing that that trend is going to continue in the foreseeable future. So when you talk about the next 12 months, we anticipate our ridership during normal commute hours on the weekday will probably maintain about the same. Hopefully it increases more, but probably maintains about the same based upon those patterns. However, we have been seeing a growth in ridership in the evenings and on weekends. And there's a great opportunity for us to capture more ridership during those time frames. And that's part of the reason why our board was an advocate in regards to reimagining our service and coming up with a new service plan. And we've come up with something in September where we will provide more service to those evening and weekend hours while still providing excellent service during normal commute hours. So that's just something in, in looking at the data and looking at service, what can we do best for our current riders as well as attracting more riders back to our system? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, Rod, Bill and Beverly, you've been fantastic. Thank you for all you're doing for transit. Thank you for sharing this information. I wanna thank East Bay EDA uh, for hosting this webinar and having this opportunity. I wanna thank all of the participants today and I wish we could have gotten to all of the questions. We didn't have enough time to get all to all of the questions, um, but clearly the pandemic has changed our society. It has changed how people uh, commute, how people work. And Bill, I'm going to quote something that you said, which I thought was right on and to the point, which is transit is an unsung hero of the economic engine in the Bay Area. We rely on transit to, in the Bay Area um, for our ability to get around and for our communities. Transit is woven into the fabric of our communities. Right now, we've got over 21 million trips happening every month. That is growing. The transit operators you've heard today are refashioning their services based upon what they're hearing from people who are using the services. We are in transition and transit needs time to fully make that transition. So some opportunities for people who participated today, um, one is to complete the realign survey. Um, go to actransit.org. I've taken the survey. It takes less than five minutes. So you could do a less than five minute good thing for transit today. Um, advocate with our state legislators, as we've talked about many times today. This is gap funding that transit needs. And Stephen, I'm hoping that maybe there's a template letter with some key points that could be sent out to the participants to uh, be sent to our legislators. And lastly, I'll just say, Take transit. It takes all of us making that choice. And when we have a choice before us, can I get there on transit? And if so, take transit. So with that, Stephen, I'm going to turn it back over to you. I want to appreciate, again, East Bay EDA. And thank you, Rod, Beverly, and Bill. Yeah, and well, thank yeah, you all. Thank I know we're in time. time. This is just the first of uh, certainly several conversations to come, uh, but really just want to uh, reiterate our appreciation for Beverly, Bill, Rod, for your great insights and Tess for your fantastic uh, support in helping to really elevate some of the salient issues that we're facing. Uh, we will send out some additional information, as you've heard, and, and definitely look to stay engaged on this, and, and uh, we appreciate everyone's partnership. We're all in this together and definitely need to, to do everything we can to keep moving our region forward. So thank you, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you.